There we go. So I am one of several ANR educators in Area 5. My name is Dana Gadikin. I'm the fourth one down in that list. And I'm going to be talking about um, the first half of gardening for pollinators. And my colleague, Phil Cox, is going to take over from there. But I'm going to start with the, um, create, the creating of a space for, to, for pollinators, to encourage them to uh, use your garden or your orchard or your vegetable plot. So this subject is near and dear to my heart because I enjoy uh, native plants, but I also am a amateur beekeeper. I'm not the best by any means, but I try. So I observe what um, my honeybees are looking for and what beneficial insects are looking for. And I try to plant accordingly. And I appreciate it when other people uh, around me plant native plants that would encourage beneficial insects and uh, honeybees to uh, use that space, creating a uh, space that encourage it, encourages pollinators to um, use. So when we are looking to design our garden to be pollinator friendly, it's kind of like taking care of, uh, I think of it as taking care of a dog. <laughs> um, you want to provide food and water for them. Uh, you also want to provide a, a variety of different plants to give them uh, all the nutrients that they need. Uh, it is an added bonus to provide them shelter and habitat so that they have somewhere to live. And of course, it's very beneficial to limit pesticide use. So we want to give them everything that they need in order to survive, food, water, uh, all the things they need in their diet and somewhere to live. So when we're going to make those changes to our garden, uh, what should we do? Well, you should think like a honeybee. So we're looking for uh, plants that have the colors that uh, honeybees recognize and respond to. So we want colors like blue, yellow, purple, and white, all these vibrant uh, colors that when a bee flies by, they're like, oh, that looks really pretty. I think I'll stop by. So those bright colors uh, incentivize those beneficial insects and those bees to go to that flower. Uh, we also want a food source or a flower that uh, releases pollen easily from the anther. So if you're fighting your food, <laughs> it's, it's, it's wasted energy. So we want some pollen that can easily be released from the anther and available to those beneficial insects and, and honeybees and butterflies. You want nutritious food, so that means a uh, high protein content for your pollen, so they're getting the biggest bang for their buck. So it's like a delicious, healthy salad instead of a like low quality hamburger. We want something that gives them a lot of nutrition. That's the kind of plant that we want to plant. And of course, it's always beneficial to have a nectar reward, a sugary treat to incentivize them to uh, use this, this flower. So, we want bright, uh, uh, bright colors. We want pollen that you can easily get, high quality pollen, and we want uh, a sugary treat to um, incentivize those insects. Another thing to consider when choosing your plants uh, for beneficial insects and pollinators is to provide season long sources of pollen and nectar. So a lot of flowers um, bloom and, and then uh, they drop their petals and the uh, pollen goes away. But what we can do to provide a better quality food source for our, our pollinators is to provide them a, a food that lasts for a long period of time. It has a long exposure where they're really able to take advantage of that flower. So when we're when, when I think of those long lasting um, food sources, I think of things that like bloom early. So that would include um, maples and willows. So for instance, this past spring, as soon as I saw the maple buds coming out, I was like, oh, my bees have something to eat. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, you also want to consider um, mid to late summer turns into this like long stretch of uh, 
a long stretch of time without flowers. So we, we don't have that, that food source for our beneficial insects and pollinators. So if you can find a flower that uh, flowers during the, the heat of the midsummer, that would be perfect for pollinators and beneficial insects. And if you're looking for something late that like it, towards the end of summer, then we're looking towards asters and goldenrods. So those are what I, when I work with my master gardeners, I always encourage them to put asters out because I'm like, when it gets to the late part of summer, my honeybees could really do with um, a pollen and a nectar source. So those asters are going to be exactly what they need. Just as I mentioned before, we want to look at um, Having a flower or plants that uh, flower in spring, summer, and fall. So that we're, when you design a garden, you're looking for about three in each category. You don't want something that just like a flash in the pan. You don't want something to just come and then disappear. It'd be really beneficial for our pollinators if it lasted for, uh, if you had some in spring, some in summer, and some in fall. When you're designing that garden, you it's it's really beneficial to plant uh, a single species together so that it's really really visible. So if you're a honeybee flying overhead and you see a large uh, swath of a uh, bees balm, you, you say, "Oh, I'm going to stop and, and visit those plants." But if you see one or two, you might miss it. So those uh planting in mass or swath plantings really make it uh, easy for those pollinators to see where it is. So you, you increase your, your um, visitations by those pollinators. Also by planting in mass, we increase foraging efficiency. So instead of uh, going to the proverbial grocery store for just bread and then coming home and then just lettuce, you go to the grocery store and you get all the things you need for a sandwich. So that's what we want to do. We want to increase their foraging efficiency. We want to make it, uh, we, we want them to get the most food as efficiently as possible so that they get the most out of it and they have the most energy. So not every insect is the same. <laughs> they all have different mouth parts. So if we include a diversity of uh, flower shapes and, and colors, we encourage a diversity of uh, pollinators and insects that are going to visit. So we want uh, some flowers that look like a uh, bees balm in that top left corner or, or red bud or uh, salvia in the bottom um, right, but they're different shapes so that different insects can access that, that pollen and that nectar. So by that diversity is what really promotes a diversity in our beneficial insects and pollinators. And I think we can all agree that diversity is a wonderful thing. So this is an example of putting in a pollinator habitat to connect two fringe plantings. So on the um, far left and then on the right and out of view are two separate uh, habitats, but we can connect them by putting in a uh, pollinator uh, friendly habitat. So that um, gives them food, possibly some water, but also a, a shelter for uh, predators that may be around. But we're connecting uh, two spaces um, making it a safer place to, to travel. So those two uh, fringe habitats were uh, connecting to make it safer and provide a, a place for our pollinators to go. Another excellent place, and I think the, the place that we may all be interest, uh, the most interested in is creating a habitat close to crops and gardens. So because small bees only go up to 500 uh, feet and bumblebees can go up to a mile, if we locate pollinator plantings right next to our vegetable crops, it's kind of like a one-stop shop. They come for the pollinator plants and they just happen to stop by um, all those, uh, your vegetables or, or your fruit trees. But by putting them right next to each other, we make it, we kind of bait them. <laughs> Come over here for the pollinator friendly plant, but stay to pollinate my apple tree. So that's uh, one way that we can kind of, well, that 
um, that the pollinator gets something and we as the gardener get something as well. So we get something uh, beautiful. We get those beautiful native plants, but we also get pollination of all the other plants that uh, we're growing for food. So just like uh, we wanted to plant a diversity of plants for those different mouth parts on, on our insects, um, some plants are actually just a buffet. So by that I mean they cater to a wide variety of pollinators and insects. So they're kind of, it's a buffet. Everyone can eat and there's something for everybody. And one of the best examples is milkweed and I think that milk, I hope that <laughs> milkweed is coming back in uh, popularity because the um, concentration of milkweed really dropped for a while and we're starting to pick up a little bit. And that's important because it is a great nectar source for our pollinators. So giving them that sugary treat to give them the energy to keep on pollinating. It is the obligate host for monarch caterpillars, so it's the only place that they can go. And, and of course, we want to see the mo uh, monarchs uh, stay. And it create and it's a, a top species such as uh, ladybugs, parasitic um, wasp, uh, pirate bugs, and swordfish flies use this. So uh, a fun story. I think of it as a fun story is that one of my uh, good friends put in a pollinator habitat in her backyard. And the way that we knew that it was quote unquote working is that we'd sit back in July and August and just watch it be teeming with all these insects, butterflies. I know I saw a pirate bug, but it was really being used. It was this high concentration, it was a um, native plant planting, a ton of milkweed, and it was just churning with all these insects meaning that it was a buffet <laughs> for those insects. So it was really being used and you could, and, and it kind of did my heart good to, to know that we are feeding our pollinators. One way that you can uh, get the most out of pollinator friendly plants is to um, plant them next to a uh, commercial crop. So pollinator plants as companion plants for crops. So when you see that, we see uh, Queen Anne's lace, prob uh, some columbine, all just there underneath the uh, commercial crop. So I think that those are pears, but we, the insects, just as before, uh, in that vegetable crop, they came for the native planting and stay to pollinate your pears. So both the, um, the insects are getting something as well as the, the farmer. The farmer is getting that pollination and maybe they wouldn't have visited those pears unless the uh, native plants were there. So it kind of baits them into that um, spot and it just and the insects just take over from there. So you kind of need to uh, guide them on their journey. You can't just like, I hope that they find it. You can take an opportunity to plant native plants, uh, native pollinator friendly plants in order to incentivize them to visit your vegetable garden, uh, your pear or apple orchard. We're really taking advantage of that situation, kind of guiding them to it. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my coworker, Phil Cox. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dana. Get my share of my screen here. Hmm. Is that see i'm trying to share the screen there and it's not doing anything can you see the screen My so screen. phil amy will probably have to give you presenter rights mm -hmm. okay amy you'd have to amy if you're trying to do it you um right click on Phil's name in the little circle and it'll give you the option as to what his role is and you can change him to presenter. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay, now can you see my screen? 
Yes, sir, we can. Okay, good deal. We'll get going here. Okay, thank you, Dana. Okay, my part of the presentation is protecting pollinators, and I'm going to give you guys some uh, tips on uh, pollinator friendly uh, control strategies. And these are our educators that um, Dana had introduced you to, in case you were late. We're Area 5 Ag and Natural Resource Educators, and my name is Phil Fox, and I'm an educator in Vermilion County, Indiana. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. Uh, we all should be doing this if we have any kind of pest in our gardens, whether it be a, a weed pest or a, an insect type pest or a, a fungus. But this uh, definition is from the Master Purdue Extension Master Gardener Manual. Um, IPM is a logical method for evaluating options for managing pests. Before a control method is used, the pest is correctly identified, the potential for plant damage is evaluated, and all control methods are considered, whether they be physical, cultural, biological, mechanical, or chemical controls, while taking into account the impact of control methods on the environment. So, um, full disclosure, I did add physical to that definition. There's uh, several different strategies or control methods that we did talk about, but the first one that we didn't talk about is to take no action. Uh, a lot of times on native plants that we've been talking about, uh, you have native bugs, native insects, and they have evolved over thousands of years with those native plants. So a lot of times I say, it's all good. Uh, native bugs eating native plants, uh, they can withstand a lot of that uh, damage that, that might occur because they've evolved with it. Where you get in trouble is when you get invasive species like the emerald ash borer has not evolved with ash trees here in, uh, in North America. And that's where we, we get a lot of damage that we cannot sustain. So we have to uh, control, try to control those emerald ash borers, which we have found uh, that's not, not very easy. So take no action, that is an alternative. Uh, physical control is the one that I added. Um, you can actually hand remove pests uh, like caterpillars, uh, cabbage loopers, uh, hornworms, especially in small backyard gardens, uh, especially in the early stages of infestations, uh, like the tomato horn, hornworm on the picture there. Uh, you can very easily remove those from your tomato plants. Uh, mechanical control, uh, something like uh, row covers uh, shown in that picture. If you use row, row covers to keep insects out, um, you do have to make sure that you do uh, uncover if they are uh, pollinated by, uh, by poll pollinators, uh, your, your vegetable crop that you might be growing. Another kind of mechanical control is if you were uh, uh, mowing or, or cutting uh, weeds that you didn't didn't want growing up or uh, tilling. Uh, cultural control, uh, you could plant pest resistant crops, uh, uh, crops uh, that like tomatoes that be resistant to uh, different, different uh, uh, blights, or you can just plant crops that don't really require um, insecticides because they don't have insect damage very much. Uh, so for instance, uh, some uh, vegetables that don't have insect problems, so you wouldn't have to use insecticides that would hurt pollinators, would be beets, carrots, onions, lettuce, okra, peas, radish. And then um, some of those uh, middle of the road uh, crops that you may or may not have to uh, apply insecticides, um, usually not, hopefully not, would be asparagus, beans, peppers, spinach, tomatoes, watermelon, but some crops that you 
can anticipate and usually have to apply insecticides that you might not want to plant. That's why I said don't plant. You might want to just consider buying those at the farmer's market or, or the grocery store uh, and concentrate on others that you don't have to apply insecticides to and those that you might not want to consider planting if you want to limit your pesticide or insecticide use would be broccoli, cabbage, cantaloupe, cauliflower, cucumber, eggplant, potato, squash, pumpkin, or uh, sweet corn. Uh, another method to control is biological control, and we want to do that by encouraging our native predators, and that we can do that by not applying insecticides and not killing our native predators. And then uh, what I always consider to be the last thing that we want to resort to in integrated pest management is having to use a chemical control uh, a pesticide in the case of controlling insects uh, would be an in insecticide. So we'll talk about using integrated pest management to control pest. Where possible, avoid pest problems in the first place. You can bury infested plant residues, uh, remove pest habitat, and like we mentioned, plant disease and plant resistant varieties. You need to carefully diagnose your pest problem. Before you apply a pesticide, make sure the pest population has reached a level where control is necessary. This is called the economic threshold. I know for backyard gardeners, you don't really have an economic threshold. So a lot of that is based on, on your experience on whether you can tolerate that much of a insect problem or not. Uh, you wanna carefully evaluate your pest control options in a combination of our integrated Pest management techniques, if appropriate, um, you can use uh, several different techniques. You might not be able to use just one. And then, like Dana said, um, you want to plant native flowering plant species to support pollinators, choosing species that are naturally resistant to pest or have evolved with a uh, pest in our in our area. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, pesticides since that's one of the major things that we want to uh, limit when we're talking about protecting pollinators. This is a, a diagram of uh, what bees uh, have to go through. It's the major routes of pesticide exposure for foraging honeybees and their transmission to the hive. Um, I, you might not be able to read that very good, but um, those major routes are the number one is a static attraction to flying bee. Uh, two is a blowing contaminated topsoil. Um, three is a runoff from surface water. Four is uptake in pollen and nectar. Five is uptake in water produced by leaves. And six is deposition on flowering plants. And we don't want to forget about our native ground nesting bees that uh, will get uh, sometimes get insecticide transmitted through movement through the soil in the in the water. Okay, so you do choose as maybe a last resort, hopefully a last resort, to use an insecticide. Um, we want to have uh, a few uh, tips here. First and foremost, you need to read and follow the insect labels. Okay. Labels commonly require the user to wear personal protective equipment and avoid, basically avoid anything that is not on the label to apply to where you're trying to kill the pest. Okay, so here in uh, recent years, some labels have added this B icon that you see, and that is to draw your attention about certain uses that can be especially toxic to bees. And we'll talk about those here in just a little bit. So you wanna use the proper rate at the right time for the correct target pest and avoid reapplying unnecessarily. So these pesticides have been researched and spent millions of dollars to get registered by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so you need to follow the directions on the right rate. I mean, just because it says to use uh, four ounces 
per, per gallon and you, you think, well, if I use eight ounces per gallon, I'll kill it worse. Well, four ounces, if four ounces will kill it, then that's what you need to use if that's what the label says. Okay, uh, pay close attention to environmental hazards and statements and all pollinator information on the label to determine if special precautions must be taken to protect pollinators. So you should be able to see that, that B icon on there, but that's not the only thing that you wanna read. You wanna read the whole label. Remember, I said, I think I said before, the label is the law. Okay, so this on the left-hand side is um, protection of uh, pollinators label that you can see. Okay, so the app application restrictions, it alerts users that there is special uh, requirements to apply this pesticide in order to protect, try to protect pollinators at least. And there's the new B icon is right there. So you can look for that. And this statement here says, this product can kill bees and other insect pollinators. So it makes clear that pesticide products can kill bees and pollinators. And a lot of times it will have on the statement, bees are often present foraging when plants and trees flower. So it makes it clear that the pesticides cannot be applied until all petals have fallen. So you have to look for that on the label. Uh, here's another statement that warns users that direct contact and ingestion could harm pollinators. And here's a statement that highlights the importance of avoiding drift. Sometimes wind can cause pesticides to drift to new areas and cause bee kills. Okay, very important, read the label. And just because you read it one year doesn't mean that you can't read it the next year because every every year they can change the label if you happen to buy a new a new product. Okay, I seem to be stuck here, let's see. Okay. Okay, and if you choose to use an insecticide, use insecticides only when necessary as a, as a last resort. Uh, do not apply insecticides preventatively when no pests are present. Um, some crops you might have to, if you know that those pests are gonna be present every, every year, there are a few. Be sure you, the insect you plan to kill is actually a pest and present in large enough numbers to harm the plant. And we, you do have resources out there. Um, there are the Purdue Plant Doctor apps that will help you determine what is wrong with your plant. Uh, there's a picture of a, a screen of the app for the Purdue Perennial Doctor. Uh, you can find those apps, and they're 99 cents each, and they're at purdueplantdoctor.com. Um, they're all the Purdue Tomato Doctor app and the Purdue Annual Flower Doctor app, the Purdue Tree Doctor app, the Shrub Doctor app, and the Turf Doctor app. So you just go in there and you can search. You got to know what kind of plant that you're trying to uh, protect, protect. So you can search by by the name of the plant, uh, if it's a tree or a shrub or a flower. If it's a tomato. Uh, you just go right down here to the diseases or the insects or the other, and then you do a search and there's lots of pictures and it will show you what you should do, recommendations on what you should do to solve your problem with that plant. Okay. So don't treat areas where pollinators visit. So very important on these uh, pictures here, we've got some hoverflies that are visiting a dandelion plant uh, we've got a honeybee that's visiting a uh, white clover. So never apply insecticides to the blooms of flowering plants. Most insecticide labels prohibit applications to blooming flowers. And also look for restrictions for pre-bloom and post-bloom. So that is sometimes on the label also. Avoid using insecticides in lawns where the flowering weeds such as dandelion and clover. If you do have to use an insecticide, in a lawn like that, try to see if you can mow as many of the flowering weeds down as possible before you apply the insecticide. 
And if you're using neonicotinoid insecticides, mow frequently enough to keep the weeds from re-blooming if you can, because these neonicotinoid insecticides, they are systemic. And when you apply those, the plant actually goes into the plant and goes into all parts of the plant. And then what gets into the pollen, it can actually harm bees when they are collecting the pollen and other pollinators. Okay, so you want to avoid drift and runoff the best you can. So don't spray when it is too windy. Usually on the label, there's a restriction on how windy it can be. Uh, you do need to have just a little bit of wind, uh, maybe uh, a two to three miles per hour sometimes, just so you know what direction your um, uh, insecticide is gonna be going while you're spraying. Don't spray when rain is forecast. Uh, a lot of times these uh, insecticides will, will wash off uh, if, if they are not uh, rain fast and that should be on, on the label. And spray only the pest infected area. Avoid hard surfaces like sidewalks and driveways. So this uh, picture here is of someone, they're not actually uh, applying any kind of a pesticide. They are actually uh, calibrating their, their equipment, so that's why they're on that, uh, that hard surface there. But you do not want to apply on hard surfaces, so try not to get any uh, overlap on your applications. Choose to use an insecticide, uh, avoid spraying uh, pollinators. So if the label contains a caution to avoid actively visiting bees, you need to apply before dawn or near sunset. So I, I don't really like applying uh, in the dark uh, before dawn, uh, but uh, near sunset would probably be uh, better. Avoid subsequent pollinator damage. The pesticide label contains a caution to avoid visiting bees. That means do not apply the pesticide on blooming because pesticides with this caution last longer than eight hours. Okay, so if you just have to use a pesticide, try to use pesticides that are, that are moderately toxic or relatively non-toxic pollinators. And there are, there are some out there. And um, in this um, publication from Purdue Extension, Pro Protecting Honeybees from Pesticides, uh, it'll list the highly toxic pesticides, these and the moderately, and then the relatively non-toxic ones. So uh, something like a seven or carbaryl in the dust form that is highly toxic. But if you get over and use the uh, XLR form, which is a, a liquid form, then that is downgraded to moderately toxic. So I know that's a, a common um, insecticide that a lot of people like to use. So you can help pollinators a lot by instead of using the dust, use use liquid form of that. But there's also very several other um, moderately and relatively non-toxic uh, insecticides that you can use that I'll refer you to that uh, publication. Okay, uh, about three years ago or maybe four, uh, Purdue Extension uh, started working on a protecting pollinator series and there are several publications that came out of that series that have a lot of valuable information in, in it for uh, homeowners and for uh, commercial uh, applicators. Uh, some I'd like to point out here um, for you guys would be the protecting pollinators in home lawns and landscapes. And before I go on, let me just say that all of these above here are, can be found at the uh, Purdue Extent Purdue Education Store, and there's the uh, the website right there. I think uh, somebody will put that in the uh, chat chat box. But uh, you can search on your favorite uh, engine, search engine for Purdue Education Store, and then when you get to the Purdue Education Store, just type in the search box protecting pollinators 
and all of these will come up. Uh, so you might want to take a look at the home lawns and landscapes one, the fruit and vegetable production one. Um, this is a good one, best management practices for Indiana poll pollinator habitat. Uh, the Indiana native plants for pet protecting pollinators. Um, that is a, a really good one. That's one of my favorite ones. It has about four pages in a table format of wildflowers, uh, native trees, native shrubs, native grasses and sedges that you can plant to help pollinators. Uh, and it will also tell you the uh, plant information about them, whether they like full sun, part sun, uh, shade, what kind of soil moisture they like, the height of the, uh, the plant, the flower color, time of the year when it blooms, and it also tell you uh, what kind of pollinators in general uh, like that particular species of, of plant. So that is a, a real good uh, resource to determine what kind of uh, Indiana native plants that you might consider planting in your garden at home. Uh, all these are downloaded for free uh, and you can print them off or just view them on your uh, on your computer. Uh, here's another one uh, that shows the pic picture here, the complex life of the honeybee, environmental, biological, and chemical challenges to colony health. So if you're at all interested in getting started in uh, beekeeping, this is a real good one. That is a free download. Uh, if you want a real slick back uh, uh, publication, you can also buy it for uh, $5.50 from the uh, Purdue Education Store. And I, you probably have to add shipping onto that too. Um, okay, one other last publication I did wanna mention was, like I say, if you do need to use insecticides in your, home garden, um, this publication here, Managing Insects in the Home Vegetable Garden uh, from Purdue, has a lot of great information on how to control those insects, what insecticides that um, you should use on those. Uh, and you can refer back from that publication, you can refer back to the publication uh, in the previous screen and to see if those, which ones you might want to use, uh, especially try to use the ones that are either moderately toxic or relatively non-toxic to pollinators. And there are, there are several uh, recommended that are in that category. And with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, participating and remind you that our next webinar in the series is May 14th, a week from today, and that will be on disease scouting and control. All I have. Thanks, Phil. Brooke, are you going to run up through the questions, please? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. It was had a lag between when I was hitting buttons and when things actually happened, but I think we're good now. Um, so if anyone currently has questions, you can type those in the chat box. Um, that's a little bit easier as, for us to see than the Q&A box. Um, and I will go through, we have three so far. Um, the first one is, I have been told that putting sulfur on my yard will control grub worms, but will the sulfur application affect the bees? Of the panelists, I have not heard anything about uh, sulfur application affecting bees. Has, has anybody else? I have not. Um, I did a little bit of cursory research when I saw the question pop up. I can't find any pest control recommendations um, concerning sulfur with lawn grubs. 
um, if anything, the sulfur would, sulfur would have more influence on your uh, nutrient content within your yard than anything else. Mm -hmm. Typically, when it comes to lawn grubs, you're probably going to get recommendations to apply something like carbaryl, and that would definitely have an impact on bee populations, especially if they're looking for uh, like blooming clover within your yard. But sulfur, I, I did not find anything that would indicate a negative impact there. Okay, our next question is, um, this may not be garden related, but we have some cedar trim on our porch. The cedar has been chewed by a large yellow and black bee. I suspect a carpenter bee. Um, my question is, there, is there anything we can use on the cedar to stop them from eating it? In a situation like that, um, I would generally recommend consider uh, contracting some professional help. Uh, carpenter bees, unfortunately, are just a major issue, and I would prefer someone use a professional's advice on that. What you can do in the meantime is try to eliminate the holes they create. They're using those for nesting. And if you can plug up the holes they create safely, I hope, to avoid getting stung, um, you'll be able to hopefully minimize some of their population. But other than that, to try to get a wood treatment on something, I really think you should contact a professional. I also added the carpentry Carpenter B publication to the chat and we'll send it out in the resources tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Okay, our next question is, um, is there a publication you would recommend for pollinator garden maintenance year to year? I actually don't know of a uh, pollinator um, garden maintenance publication that we have through Purdue. Does any, do any of the other panelists have a recommendation for uh, a resource? You guys essentially posted most of the ones that I would recommend in the chat. I would use those as your basis to plan from year to year. I think that's something we can uh, take back to Purdue and maybe we can develop something. So thank you for asking that question. Next question is, can you recommend something to kill fleas in the yard? Bob may have some um, suggestions, but I did also post our flea, flea publication into the chat and we will send that along tomorrow as well. Uh, the only thing that I would say in the yard is just simply try to keep your grass cut low. Um, anything that you would try to apply to control a flea population would undoubtedly have a pretty detrimental impact on the other insects that you're probably wanting to encourage. Uh, I would read through that publication, take its suggestions to heart, but just off the top of my head, keep your grass low and make sure any pets you have um, try to make sure you do some flea control on them as well. Don't let your dogs get a case of the fleas and just carry it around. Protect them and it'll protect you. Okay. The next question is um, on apple trees. So it says, I need to spray our apple trees to obtain better apples. My plan is to use neem oil after the petals have fallen. Is this the best thing to do? They've already tried um, to pick and plant the most resistant apple varieties for their location. So good for them. I mean, sometimes it's an afterthought as to like the varieties, but choosing the appropriate varieties, definitely step one. So we have another great publication on that as well. Um, uh, apple trees in Indiana do have a, 
quite a bit of pest pressure, both from disease and insect pests. Um, and we have a publication on managing um, pests in home fruit plantings that uh, we will include in the resources. It's posted in the chat, but we'll we'll send it along with the recording link as well. Um, and neem oil, as as Bob can speak to, um, have some um, insect repellent properties, some antibacterial properties, even some antifungal properties. But I'm not sure that neem oil alone will get you the results that you are looking for. And Bob, feel free to chime in with additional thoughts on that. You're absolutely right, Amy. Um, neem oil will act as a step in a preventative program. Um, I would combine the use of neem oil or other horticultural oils along with some monitoring to check on how your pest populations are doing. Um, I would also identify in particular what pests are happening there because if you're just getting some cat facing by stink bugs, it could mean a whole different story as compared to if you're getting an infestation by, say, plum curculio. One means that apples may still be usable, whereas the other one means that stone fruit will become an apple. Um, based on what is attacking your fruit is when I would make the decision on what I'm going to use to get rid of those insects. Great, yeah, and I just want to um, reemphasize what Bob said. Um, it's really important to um, figure out exactly what's happening there. We have the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. So if you work with your local extension educator, um, they can either, one, get a photo sample sent in, which is free right now due to the uh, coronavirus concerns, or if you send in an actual plant sample for them to do tests on, um, or to examine in person, it's only $11. Um, so it's definitely worth getting that test done to have a precise um, management plan moving forward. Um, the next question was, maybe I can put these together, the next two questions. Um, I'm guessing Bob may be the, the answer for this. Um, are wood bees a positive pollinator? And then the second question with the new Murder Hornet News, is there any new publications on how to deal with those while protecting the honeybees? Um, I'll address the uh, would-be question first. Off the top of my head, I do not recall. Um, I can try to look that up um, and get you that information. I imagine they probably are not at the moment because I think they may actually be predatory. But like I said, I want to double check that because I just don't remember off the top of my head. Um, as for the issue with murder hornets, um, this has been a big question, especially for me in the last few days. Uh, these you may hear of as another name, such as Asian giant hornet or Japanese hornet. This is another one of the invasive species that has entered our country. Currently, it's only located in very small areas on our coasts. Uh, Washington State is one area where it's located. Yes, beekeepers will find them challenging. It only takes a few hornets to decimate a hive and they can do so within the scope of a day. Um, and yes, the hornet sting does pose a danger to humans. Um, that danger is limited though, because in order to get a hornet to sting you, you will have to work at it. They are not aggressive by nature. And for the bee populations, it is simply too early to tell. Um, our native bees don't have the behaviors of bees where the hornets are from. Those bees have a behavior where they will cover a hornet and they'll vibrate their wings until they essentially kill the hornet by feeding it up. Our bees don't have that. So right now, there's probably going to be a lot of research done depending on how quickly they spread based on what we can do to try to treat them. Uh, the best thing you can do for the moment is just keep your eyes open. If you see something that you wonder if it's a murder hornet, contact us, your local extension office, um, look at some of the invasive species monitoring programs that we'll be happy to tell you about. But to give you an idea, um, we have European hornets all over Indiana. They're about an inch, maybe even up to an inch and a half in length, and they look scary. Uh, the Japanese hornet looks even scarier. It's two inches long with a bright yellow head and a dark body. Um, it is like a Volkswagen flying through the air. You will know it when you see it. 
Um, so the best thing you can do is just keep your eyes open and we will get as much research information to you as soon as it comes out. There's also uh, on May 5th, a publication, not um, an article came from uh, Cliff Sadolf. And I know that a couple of educators put it on their Facebook page. The Vigo County was, I, I put it on the Vigo County's uh, page just about um, the murder horner and, and, and what your concern, concern should be. So it's not a publication, but it is an article written by um, some of the specialists on campus. And I will also add this, um, the Clay County Facebook page is going to be having a Facebook Live tomorrow at noon where I'll be talking about the murder hornet um, and give you some additional information on it and try to answer some questions too. So that'll be at noon tomorrow on the Clay County Facebook page, the Clay County Extension Facebook page. So uh, we'll send the, the link to the article on the murder hornet as well in case um, you're not able to join uh, Bob's uh, Facebook Live. Um, I did also want to mention um, somebody mentioned in the chat during the presentation that um, I can't recall whether uh, about a tomato hornworm and the, the, the comment in the chat was that it's a tobacco hornworm. Um, they do look very similar. The important thing really to know is that they, 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 um, are both garden pests, both tobacco and tomato hornworms are garden pests. They feed on a number of different vegetables and the management of them is um, is similar. And we're certainly sorry uh, if we did make an error, uh, none of us are perfect. So Brooke, if you have uh, additional questions we need to go through, I'll let you get back to Okay, yes. Um, the next one is, um, there's a lot of home remedies um, posted on social media in various places for insect control. For example, soapy water. I know personally I've seen some that say add vinegar. I don't even remember what, you know, lots of different mixes. Are any of those um, okay for pollinators or is there um, concern there? I'll say the, uh, yeah, the soapy water, that, that's not going to harm your your pollinators, or if it's, if you're just getting aphids off of like say uh, milkweeds or some other, if you just use a strong stream of water and knock knock them off the, the plant, then the aphids, they can't get back up on, on the plant. So they're, they're kind of stuck. So that, that would be a good solution for like on your, uh, on your milkweeds, aphids on your milkweeds. So I think that also is highly dependent on the home remedy. Like it, it's, I think it'd be unfair to say that all home remedies are, are wrong. We just need, I think we need a little bit more information. So home remedies though, um, aren't necessarily reliable. Um, we don't advise folks to utilize home remedies. Um, you, if you're interested in using a, a soap, Type product for pest control, you should look for an insecticidal soap that has um, gone through the pesticide registration process, been tested for effectiveness and safety, rather than um, relying on, uh, you know, things that you might find on the internet. We definitely try to work with evidence-based um, information and, and make recommendations off uh, evidence-based um, uh, publications and research. Um, so, um, so it can be an effective uh, insecticide, but um, really look for those insecticidal soaps that are labeled and have um, directions that um, will guide you in the application and reapplication of that product. Yeah, and the, the great thing about soaps are for the most part, of course, read the label on all of them, but there's no uh, harvest restrictions for after when you uh, apply insecticidal uh, soaps. Okay, uh, the next question is, um, we have 10 acres of native wildflowers. This is our third year of coverage. Last year, we had a battle with um, the weed mayor's tail. 
Do you have suggestions on how to safely kill this weed? Uh, yeah, the mare's tail, that is a winter annual. So um, I would suggest uh, just mowing it before it produces its, uh, its seed head because its seed head has hundreds, if not more uh, seeds on it and it will it'll keep keep growing as long as you don't have a, a thick uh, thick planting. So it, I would just try mowing it and uh, see how that works for for a couple of years without without uh, harming your your um, wildflower plantings. You, you might have to mow it mow it high. Good. Um, and I think I'll add an interesting tidbit there. Um, I am from southern Indiana, and I guess my father grew up, and what he calls mayor's tail is actually giant ragweed. So um, make sure the mayor's tail is what I would say the real mayor's tail and not what um, some people I know in southern Indiana call giant, giant ragweed mayor's tail. So um, it's important to for that distinction as well, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think for what we call uh, mare's tail around here is uh, Canada canadensis. It's the uh, is the Latin name. So, okay. Uh, the next question is: Is diatomaceous earth harmful to pollinators? Yeah, it it is. Um, if if uh, they get it on on them, and so you you wouldn't want to apply it on the uh, on the actual flower itself of the of the plant. Um, you might be able to apply it on the stem and leaves and not harm them so much. What what do you think, Bob? I think that most likely you're going to be using diatomaceous earth on fruits rather than actual flowers. Um, I don't think there's a reason why you would want to apply it on flowers in the first place. You're probably going to be doing it after the blossoming period is finished anyways. Okay, and we have one last question. Um, is there a publication that shows photos of the insect and damage so I can understand uh, who or what the culprit is? Uh, publication I had at the very end, um, Managing Insects in the Home Vegetable Garden by uh, Purdue Extension. Um, if you type that number in the uh, Purdue Education Store in the uh, search box, just type in E-21-W, and that has a lot of good uh, photos in there of uh, the insect and the insect damage. This would also be a good moment too, when you're unsure about what damage, what is doing the damage, contact your extension educators or your local master gardeners. Um, we can help you with that. Okay, well, okay, that is all the questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. We've wrapped up the questions. We thanks for your thank you for your attendance today. Um, we will see you for our final session next Thursday, uh, where we where we will talk about disease scouting and control. Thank you all. Have a good week.